The Privileges and Immunities of State Citizenship Chapter 1 History of the Comity Clause It is provided by the Federal Constitution 1 that, the Citizens of each state shall be entitled to all privileges and Immunities of citizens in the several states This clause Hereafter called for the sake of convenience the comity Causal, it was said by Alexander Hamilton, may be Esteemed the basis of the union Its object and effect are Outlined in Paul v. Virginia in the following words was undoubtedly the object of the clause in question to place the citizens of each state upon the same footing with citizens of other states, so far as the advantages resulting from citizenship in those states are concerned. It relieves them from the disabilities of alienage in other states i. it inhibits discriminating legislation against them by other states, one ton gives them the right of free ingress into other states and egress from them. It ensures to them in other states the same freedom possessed by the citizens of those states in the acquisition and enjoyment of property and in the pursuit of happiness, and it secures to them in other states the equal protection of the laws. It has been justly said that no provision in the Constitution has tended so strongly to constitute the citizens of the United States one people as this. Indeed, without some provision of the kind removing from the citizens of each state the disabilities of alienage in the other states, the republic would have constituted little more than a league of states, it would not have constituted the union which now exists. The words privileges and immunities, like the greater part of the legal phraseology of this country, have been carried over from the law of Great Britain, and recur. 1 Art. 40 Sector 2, D. I. I Willoughby, Constitutional Law, Volume 1, page 213. The Federalist, No. LXXX, 8 Wall 168, 19 Lead. 357, Citing Lemon v. People, 20 N, Y, 607. 9. 10 State Citizenship Plus Constantly Either As Such or In Equivalent Expressions From The Time Of Magna Charta. For all practical purposes they are synonymous in meaning, and originally signified a peculiar right or private law conceded to particular persons or places whereby a certain individual or class of individuals was exempted from the rigor of the common law. Privilege or immunity is conferred upon any person when he is invested with a legal claim to the exercise of special or peculiar rights authorizing him to enjoy some particular advantage or exemption. Point 1. The Comity Clause, as is indicated by the quotation from Paul v. Virginia, was primarily intended to remove the disabilities of alienage from the citizens of every state while passing through or doing business in any of the several states. But even without this removal of disability, the citizens of the several states would have been entitled to an enjoyment of the privileges and immunities accorded to alien friends and these were by no means inconsiderable at the English law. In the early period of English history practically the only class of aliens of any importance were the foreign merchants and traders. To them the law of the land afforded no protection, for the privilege of trading and for the safety of life and limb they were entirely dependent on the royal favour, the control of commerce being a royal prerogative hampered by no law or custom as far as concerned foreign merchants. These could not come into or leave the country, or go from one place to another, or settle in any town for purposes of trading, or buy and sell, except upon the payment of heavy tolls to the king. This state of affairs was changed by Magna Charta, chapter 41 of which reads. All merchants shall have safe and secure exit from England and entry to England, with the right to tarry there and move about by land as by water, for buying and selling by the ancient and right. I. C. Magill v. Brown, Federation Cass. Number 8952, 16 Federation Cass. 408, 6 words and phrases, 5 SB 3. 558, A. J. Lynn, 
Privileges and Immunities of Citizens of the United States, in Columbia University Studies in History, Economics, and Public Law, Vol. 54, page 31. Digitized by Kuzai. History of the Comity Clause 2. Customs, quit from all evil tolls, except, in time of war, such merchants as are of the land at war with us. And if such are found in our land at the beginning of the war, they shall be detained, without injury to their bodies or goods, until information be received by us, or by our chief justiciar, how the merchants of our land found in the land at war with us are treated, and if our men are safe there, the others shall be safe in our land. T. Whatever may have been the motives of the barons in securing the adoption of this chapter, and since they had no particular love for the merchants of the town, it may well be that these were not entirely disinterested, it was not regarded with much favour by the latter class. The right to exact tolls and place restrictions upon all rival traders who were not members of their guilds, whether foreigners or not, was a cherished privilege of the chartered boroughs, and chapter 13 of Magna Charter had guaranteed to these the full enjoyment of all their ancient liberties and free customs, as the result was a continual struggle on the part of the English merchants to put restrictions on foreign traders. The latter, however, enjoyed the royal favour, and by the Charter Mercatoria of 1303 the provisions of Magna Charter in this respect became a reality, various privileges and exemptions being conferred in order to offset increased rates of duty. During the reigns of Edward II and Edward III a varying policy was pursued by the Crown with respect to alien merchants. The Statute of 1328 abolishing the staples beyond the sea and on this side provided that all merchants, strangers and privy may go and come with their merchandises, after the tenor of the Great Charter, nine and seven years later this privilege was further confirmed by an act which, in considerable detail, placed strangers and See this provision is commented upon with admiration by Montesquieu, who says. La grande chartre des Anglois defend de Cisa et de confisca en cas de les marchandises des negotiants et trueurs, a moins que any soit par appraisals. Tu est beaucoup la nat ten en Anglois et fait de cela un des articles de salibet, el esprit des lois. Book XX, Chapter 14. 8 C. Pollock and Maitland, Vol I pp. 447-448. With respect to the inconsistency between these two chapters. E2 Ettiwood 3, C, 9. Tilda Goosel. 12 State Citizenship. Residence upon an exact equality in all branches of trade. Wholesale and retail, under the express declaration that no privileged rights of chartered boroughs should be allowed to interfere with its enforcement. Point 10 The provisions of these statutes do not seem to have been strictly enforced. And under Richard II, the privileges of the boroughs were restored, although freedom of trade with respect to alien merchants was, in theory at least, still recognized. L1 not only with respect to trading, but also in regard to several other privileges, did alien friends enjoy many im. Portant rights. According to Blackstone, an alien born may purchase lands or other estates, but not for his own use, for the king is thereupon entitled to them. If an alien could acquire a permanent property in lands he must owe an aljance, equally permanent with the property, to the king of England, which would probably be inconsistent with that which he owes to his own natural liege lord, besides that thereby the nation M.I. tilde H.T. in time be subject to foreign in B.U.N.s, and feel many other inconveniences, wherefore, by the civil law such contracts were also made void, but the prince had no such advantage of forfeiture thereby as with us in England. Among other reasons which might be given for our constitution, it seems to be intended by way of punishment for the alien's presumption, in attempting to acquire any landed property, for the vendor is not affected by it, he having resigned his right and received an equivalent in exchange. Yet an alien may acquire a property in goods, money, another personal estate, or 
Tilda may hire a house for his habitation, for personal estate is of a transitory and movable nature, and besides this indulgence to strangers is necessary for the advancement of trade. Aliens, also, may trade as freely as other people, only they are subject to certain higher duties at the custom house, and there are also some obsolete statutes of Henry VIII, prohibiting alien artificers to work for themselves in this kingdom, but it is generally held that they were virtually repealed by statute 5 allies, c. 7. Also an alien may bring an action concerning personal property, and make a will, and dispose of his personal estate, not as it is in France, where the one QNE, at the death of an alien is entitled to all he is worth, by the droit d'Aubain or jus albinatus, unless he has a peculiar exemption, no denizen twelve can be of the privy council or either house times of parliament or have any office of trust, civil or military, or be capable of any grant of lands, etc., from the crown.li. Aliens also had no inheritable blood and were incapable of taking or transmitting property by descent. Point 16 It may thus be seen that, independently of any constitutional provision, the citizens of the 13 original states were entitled to the enjoyment of a considerable class of privileges upon removal from their own to another state. There was, on the other hand, much room for discriminatione as well, and the jealousy which existed between the states, coupled with the fact that each of these W.A. tilde now fully capable of changing the rules of the English common and statute law to suit its own purposes, left no guarantee as to the length of time during which the citizens of the several states would be capable of enjoying even such privileges as were accorded to alien friends. Moreover, it was generally felt that Americans should be regarded as more closely related to one another than to citizens of foreign countries, and that something more than an alien status was needed if the inhabitants of the several states were to constitute one people. It was with this idea of securing a stronger bond than had previously existed between the states that the fourth article of the Articles of Confederation was adopted. This, the immediate precursor of the Comity Clause, reads. The better to secure and perpetuate mutual friendship and inter course among the people of the different states in this union, the free inhabitants of each of these states, tilde uppers, vagabonds, and fugitives from justice accepted, shall be entitled to all the privileges and immunities of free citizens in the several states and the people of each state shall have free ingress and egress to and from any other state, and shall enjoy therein all the privileges of trade and commerce, subject to the same duties, impositions, and restrictions as the inhabitants thereof respectively, provided that such restrictions shall not extend so far as to prevent the removal of property imported into any state to any other state of which the owner is an inhabitant, and provided also that no imposition, duty, or restriction, shall be laid by any state on the property of the United States, or either of them. Madison says Lee. There is a confusion of language here which is remarkable. Why 16 Blackstone, Commentaries, Vol. 2, page 24. 111 The Federalist, No. XLII. By Google. 14 State Citizenship. The terms free inhabitants are used in one part of the article, free citizen in another, and people in another, or what was meant by soup adding to. All privileges and immunities of free citizens. All the privileges of trade and commerce cannot easily be determined. It seems to be a construction scarcely avoidable, however, that those who come under the den, lionation of free inhabitants of a state, although not citizens of such state, are entitled, in every other state, to all the privileges of free citizens of the latter, that is, to great it, privileges than they may be entitled to in their own state, so that it may be in the power of a particular state. Or rather every state is laid under a necessity, not only to confer the rights of citizenship in other states upon any whom it may admit to such rights within itself, but upon any whom it may allow to become inhabitants within its jurisdiction. Point 18. This article was proposed in its final shape on November 13, 1777, 
and adopted by the Continental Congress. In spite of its disconnected and loose structure, it must have been regarded as satisfactory, for the only amendments proposed were of little importance. On June 22, 1778, the delegates from Maryland proposed that the word paupus be omitted, and the words that one state shall not be burthened with the maintenance of the poor who may remove into it from any of the others in the Union, added. On June 25, 1778, the delegates from South Carolina moved to insert the word white between the words free inhabitants, so that the privileges and immunities granted should be definitely secured to the white race only. They also suggested certain other verbal changes. A similar proposal was embodied in the Order of Ratification of Georgia, in which it was suggested in addition that after the word vagabonds there should be inserted all persons who refuse to bear arms in defense of the state to which they belong, and all persons who have been or shall be attainted of high treason in any of the United States. None of these alterations was adopted. Point one foot I in the Journal of the Constitutional Convention the present clause of the Constitution is credited with appearing, in the form in which it now reads, in the plan laid. 18 see also story on the Constitution, Sector 1799. One foot one inch Journal of the Continental Congress, Volume 2, pp 326. 598. Digitized by Kuz IEJ History of the Comity Clause 15 Before the convention by Charles Pinckney of South Carolina, 18 and until the speech delivered in the House of Representatives on February 13, 1821, with respect to the Admis Sion of Missouri, he specifically laid claim to its authorship.18 but in the Observations on the plan of government submitted to the Federal Convention in Philadelphia, on 28 May, 1787, by Mr. Charles Pinckney, printed by Francis Childs in October, 1787, the fourth article of the Articles of Confederation is recommended for adoption practically untouched, 20 and, in view of the historical doubt as to the identity of the so-called Pinckney draft printed in the Journal of the Convention with that actually submitted by Mr. Pinckney and afterward. Turned over to the committee on detail, it does not seem probable that Pinckney's claim can be sustained. However this may be, the clause as it now reads was submitted to the Convention by the committee on detail on August 6, 1787, as Article 14 of the proposed Constitution The only altera Tyon suggested was that some provision should be included in favour of property in slaves, but upon the question being put it was passed in the affirmative, South Carolina being the only state voting against it, and Georgia being divided. It was later placed in its present position in the Constitution by the Committee on Style.21. 18 C. Eliot's Debates, 2 D.E.D., pp. 245, 249, 18 Annals of Congress, 16th Song, 2 D. Cess, p. IIJ4. 20 M. Farrand, Records of the Federal Convention, Volume 3, p. So. 21 Farrand, Volume 1, pp. 173, 443, 577. Digitized by Kuz I.E. General scope of Tichy Comity Clause The wording of the Comity Clause is obviously very general, and standing by itself, it might be construed in such a way as to obliterate state lines entirely, since the citizens of every state in the Union might be regarded as entitled by it to identically the same privileges and immuni. Ties the first reported case bearing upon the clause is Campbell v. Morris, one which was decided in 1797. This case is rather remarkable in some ways, in that it recognizes that the provisions of the clause are to be given a limited opera tie-on, and indicates fairly accurately the line of demarcation, which has been generally adopted by the courts since that. 
time. The language of the court, speaking through judge. Chase, is as follows. By the second section of the fourth article of the Constitution of the United States, the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all the privileges and immunities of citizens of the several states. Privilege and immunity are synonymous, or nearly so. Privilege signifies a peculiar advantage tilde exemption, immunity, immunity sig nifies exemption, privilege. The peculiar advantages and exemptions contemplated under this part of the Constitution, may be ascertained if not with precision and accuracy, yet satisfactorily. By taking a retrospective view of our situation antecedent to the formation of the first general government, or the confederation, in which the same clause is inserted f gerbatim, j one of the great objects must occur to every person, which was the enabling the citizens of the several states to acquire and hold real property in any of the states, and deemed necessary, as each state was a sovereign, and pendant state, and the states had confederated only for the purpose of general defence and security, and to promote the general welfare. It seems agreed, from the manner of expounding of the words immunities and privileges, by the counsel on both sides, that a particular and limited operation is to be given to these words, and not a full and comprehensive one. It is agreed it does not mean the right of election, the right of holding offices, the right of being. 13 Ha. And McHen. MD, 535. I this is obviously a misstatement. 16. Digitized by Kuz i.e. Tilda. 305, General Scope of the Committee Clause 17. Elected. The court are of opinion it means that the citizens of all the states shall have the peculiar advantages of acquiring and holding real as well as personal property and that such property shall be protected and secured by the laws of the state in the same manner as the property of the citizens of the state is protected. It means, such property shall not be liable to any taxes, or burdens which the property of the citizius is not subject to. It tilde. Also mean that as creditors, they shall be on the same footing with the state creditor, in the payment of the debts of a deceased debtor. It secures and protects personal rights. The latitude for difference in construing the comity clause is well exemplified by the peculiar interpretation put upon it by the Supreme Court Times of Tennessee in the case of Kincaid v. Francis, decided in ISN. The court there denied that the clause was intended to prevent discriminer. Tie on by a state in according privileges to its own citizens. As against those of other states, on the contrary, it regard the clause as intended to compel the federal government government to extend the same privileges and immunities to the citizens of every state, and to prevent that government from granting privileges or immunities to citizens of some of the states which were not likewise granted to those of all the others. This ingenious interpretation, though fully capable of application as far as the words of the clause itself are concerned, can, of course, be viewed in no other light than as erroneous if the history of the adoption of the clause, its position in the Constitution, and the wording of the similar article in the Articles of Confederation are taken into account. And, as a matter of fact, this is the only times case in which such an interpretation occurs. An interpretation for the most part similar to that given. 3 Cook, 10, 49 A somewhat similar view is, however, taken in Chapman v. Miller, 2 Spears, S.C. 769, in which it was said by Butler, J., I cannot find that any of the writers or commentators on the Constitution have ever undertaken to expound this article either by explanation or definition, and I shall not quit the concrete of this case by resorting to any abstract disquisitions on the subject or attempt to do that which others have avoided. This much may be said on the subject with entire confidence that it is not in the power of Congress to give privileges to citizens of one state over those of another, bv any measure which it can constitutionally adopt, nor can it give to a state a power to do a thing which it could not do itself. a. Tilda G. Uzel. 18 State Citizenship. In Campbell v. Morris, but going somewhat farther than. The decision in that case is afforded in Caulfield v. Coriel.L. 
This case, reported in 1825, is the first federal authority. Upon the question of the construction of the clause, and it is of particular importance in any examination of the gen. Aerial scope of the clause in that the language used in the connection, though obiter, has been made the basis of numerous decisions since that time, and is even now DTEID. Occasionally with approval. That part of the decision deal. In with the privileges and immunities of state citizenship. Reads. The inquiry is, what are the privileges and immunities of citizens in the several states? We feel no hesitation in confining these expressions to those privileges and immunities which are, in their nature, fundamental, which belong, of R.I. tilde H.T., to the citizens of all free governments, and which have, at all times, been enjoyed by the citizens of the several states which compose this union, from the time of their becoming free, independent, and sovereign. What these fundamental principles are, it would perhaps be more tedious than difficult to enumerate. They may, however, be all comprehended under the following general heads, protection by the government earnment, the enjoyment of life and liberty, WLTH the right to acquire and possess property of every kind, and to pursue and obtain happiness and safety, subject, nevertheless, to such restraints as the government earnment may justly prescribe for the general good of the whole. The right of a citizen of one state to pass through, or to reside in. The any other state, for purposes of trade, agriculture, professional pursuits, or otherwise, to claim the benefit of the writ of habeas corpus, to institute and maintain actions of any kind in the courts of the state, to take, hold, and dispose of property, either real or personal, and to an exemption from higher taxes or impositions than are paid by the other citizens of the state may be mentioned as some of the particular privileges and immunities of citizens, which are clearly embraced. By the general description of privileges deemed to be fundamental, to which may be added, the elective franchise, as regulated and established by the laws or constitution of the state in which it is to be exercised. These and many others which might be mentioned, are, strictly speaking tilde, privileges and immunities, and the enjoyment of them by the citizens of each state, in every upper state, was manifestly calculated, to use the expressions of the preamble of the corresponding provision in the old articles of Con. Federation, the better to secure and perpetuate mutual friendship and intercourse among the people of the different states of the Union. But we cannot accede to the proposition, that, under this provision of the Constitution, the citizens of the several states are entitled to participate in all the rights which belong exclusively to the citizens of any other particular state merely upon the ground that they are enjoyed by those citizens. 